So thank you very much, Saul. Thank you for, it's great to be here. I just flew in from Norway, where I'm from. And um, last time I talked about control is for beginners in the context of jazz. Today I'm gonna to talk about it in the context of my life. I, um, I grew up in Norway. Um, here's a picture of the last session and today I'm still an improviser. We're all improvisers, and I learned how to improvise from my mother. When I say improvisation, I mean postponing decisions until you have enough information to know how to get dressed for the weather, or what to say when somebody has said something, or how to respond when you have to jump, or you're pushed into the next S-curve. Um, I grew up with my mother. Here she is in 1980, with one of her own jewelries. She was an artist, self-taught, and um, two weeks into my first freshman year as a jazz performance major at New England Conservatory, she died from a brain hemorrhage, 43 years old, uh, on September 13th, actually, 37 years ago. And uh, I got pushed into a new S-curve. Um, and this is her name, and we're going to show you some of her works. Um, she left me with... 30 garbage bags of art. She was completely unknown. Um, and recently, um, she was rediscovered. So I posted some stuff online in about 2013, and uh, I got a call from the National Galleries in Norway, and they came to my house, and that ended up being an exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Oslo, uh, retrospective filled the entire first floor with my garbage bags. I have over a thousand pieces of work that she did. She was not well regarded in her, by her contemporaries because she was jumping between different mediums all the time. Um, but the, the exhibition was the most visited exhibition ever. And she was now hailed as the most, one of the most important art innovators in Norway after World War II. That's pretty cool. Uh, my mom got pregnant when she was 19, met my father, and it happened very quickly. She got married a, a month after she got pregnant, and she had just started art school, and she got kicked out for being pregnant, which also happened to Patti Smith. And they continue doing that in Norway until 1967. So this is in 1957. You see me here with my mom, and you also see her dancing. And I think that was part of the problem, uh, being 20 years old with a little child, is that you wanted to do many things. And being a mother was just one of them. So she was self-taught, and she spent her entire life experimenting. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the lessons that I got from that. And the first one was the one she had to deal with when she got pregnant, which was to accept the offer, which is the most important thing I've learned in jazz and in life, is that if you spend energy resisting the stuff you don't control, that's for beginners. So the first message is accept the offer. And one of my first recollections of being in a situation that I didn't control was this. We were traveling over the mountains, and this is my mom and me, I'm eight years old, and I'm completely embarrassed <laughs> because she loved going into the water. At this point here, it's 39 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about four degrees according to Siri. And, um, and she went into the water, I just hated it. And, but it taught me an important lesson. You can't control all the people. You don't have to take responsibility for your own parents. That was a very empowering lesson. And this whole idea of not having control, I think of life, maybe because I grew up with art all the time, I think of life as a canvas. And this is a canvas, and this is one of my mother's works. And when you throw something onto that canvas, you basically eliminate a bunch of options. But at the same time, you open up new options that you haven't thought of, right? And this happens in life too. Every time we jump to a new S-curve, every time we make an important decision, new opportunities open up that we haven't thought of. That's, what, that's why conversations are interesting, because they're always different, because they are really the process of jazz. 
the process of creating something that is always new. I mean, that's the heart of innovation. That's what art is, and that's what life is. So this image of not being in control because you started something, and I've been speculating for a long time, is it complexity when you have an interaction with a canvas the way my mother would have every day? Is it complexity? Is it controllable? And it isn't. Once you start, once you make that first choice, once you kill off those options, new options open up. And then you could either decide to continue or stop. And in a piece of art, maybe you continue, maybe you stop. That's the artist's privilege. So the second lesson was practice. Actually, play while you practice. That was one of her slogans. Play while you practice. And that's exploration over exploitation. It's saying that even when you are exploiting, always be exploring. Always practice. And if you are faced with that canvas, that's never the same. That's always different. I mean, if you continue to try to do the same things, you're going to be in, pro in trouble. So you always have to try new things. And life teaches us that over and over again. You have to try new things. That's how we learn. That's how we meet unpredictability. That's how we meet turbulence. And that has been a mantra for me as a trained musician. I was trained as a musician and as a, a, having a business degree. And I worked both in business and in music. And always practicing, every day, everything I do, even this talk, I've never done this before, every time it's a chance to get better and to learn something new. That's one of the mantras. And whenever I, you know, my mother would, every night she would work on her art, and every morning when I came into the studio, it would be filled with new works, every day. People thought she wasn't doing anything because she was always working at night. And then she went to bed, and she woke up around the time I got back from school. And she had breakfast, and we talked about art. So without knowing it, I kind of got this, um, um, I got this training to appreciate art. These are some of the enamel works. So these are, these are some of them phallic, I might argue, uh, but that's, you know, that, that changes your perspective if I say that. But these are, so this is melted glass on copper, which she did for a long time. I think it actually killed her because the, the, the fumes from the oven that she had in her studio, uh, she just inhaled it, you know, not thinking that it was dangerous, which it was. But I have about 200 of these, and you know, she, she produced, these are about this big. Um, she was always experimenting, and she was talking to me about it, and you know, here's a painting about this big, and I would come home from school, and she would always ask me, and always engage me, and said, what do you think? What, what does it need? What does the picture need? Just like good musicians, you know, they always think about what will the music need? Not what am I good at, but what does the music dictate? And she would ask me the same question, and I said, well, I think it may, maybe it needs a little red. And she says, okay. And then she would say, what kind of red would you like? And I said, well, maybe that spray box over there. And she said, well, what, what, what do you want to do with it? I said, I don't know, maybe make a circle. Where, where do you want to put the circle? And that way, she forced me to make decisions. And she also, once I had finished, once we finished that discussion, she would go, Pfft. you know. And because she didn't have an art education, you know, it, it, or maybe she would let me do it, you know, the circle might not be perfect, which a lot of people who had spent five years in school learning how to make a circle, you know, they'd be kind of, <laughs> they wouldn't like that. And that was another important lesson, that even if the elements are not perfect, the context can be. It's how you fit it into the context. So always practicing. Here's another piece. Can you see what this is? It's a car grill. It's a grill of a car turned upside down, and then she put a heart inside. She was using everything. She was a hoarder, a collector of everything, and she used everything. She was always looking for opportunities to practice, to explore. What if I do this? How if I put this together? And you know, this is not jewelry. This is this big. You know, it's, it's not a sculpture. It's kind of some, some hybrid. And what she was always after was finding her own voice. You know, she had this saying, don't let go of your own thing. That was her one thing they always said. And it was not about, it's not about creating your own voice. It was not about saying, oh, I have to be more original. It was about letting go, but not leaving your core. 
always developing that voice. Here is one of the images late in her career, when she was becoming you know, more confident, less friction. And it was interesting, this is one of the sketches for an, an exhibition at the Jazz Festival in Norway in 1979. And when the curators looked at this for the exhibition, they thought that some of the drafts were much better. Maybe because she was less self-aware. She was just throwing it out there. She was just producing this while listening to John Coltrane. She, this is produced, and you know, she would, might say to me, what do you want? And I always said, give me some more red. <laughs> uh, but, and she, she made these stamps. As you can see, there are small stamps in here so she could work faster. And she used spray paint. This is made on wrapping paper because she was always broke. You know, she, Alan Weber asked me what drove her, and I said it was certainly not money. It was, I think that all her artworks are really a byproduct of her practicing, of her exploring. It's like a party, you know, if you look at after a party and you see all these empty bottles, you might think that this party was about producing empty bottles, but it wasn't. You know, it was something completely different. <laughs> She was inspired by nature. Here is a piece of jewelry, and you can see the sketchbook and the process that went into it. But she was always keeping that core. And that has been important for me growing up and living my life for the 37 years after she died, was how can I use everything that I've learned? How can I put them together in novel ways, which is what language is, which is what life is, which is what improvisation is, is to compile elements together in a novel shape that fits an ongoing context. I mean, that's, that's what we do when we play, that's what she was doing, that's what we were all doing. And you can't control that, but you can influence it. If you're present, if you really observe all the options and the possibilities, and follow your instincts. So what did I learn from it? We often say that Preparation is everything. I think that everything is preparation. And in our lives, we have gone, my family and I have gone through some amazing transformations, unwanted uh, S-curves, if you want. And the first one happened in 95, when I met my wife, and she immediately got pregnant, uh, 94. And, she, and after dating for seven months, we had a child a premature child, and we spent seven months in intensive care unit learning how to accept that we were not in control, having it rubbed in our face. And then the same thing happened in, 80, 80, in 98. Here's a picture that you can see of me holding my daughter's hand, actually she holding my finger. This is my youngest daughter. But by the time we experienced this again, we were doing it for the second time, and the first time had prepared us. And right after this happened, I had a friend over uh, that I went to college with, and you know, he looked at this and he said, well, I'm, I'm lucky. And I said, what, nothing happened? And he said, yeah. And when people think about us, they often feel sorry for us, but you know, this is life, and you can't control it, but you can enjoy it, and you can influence it. Here's our daughters today. Hannah and Sissel, Sissel to the right, she lost her vision. They've both been uh, lucky, and we've worked very hard. And there's my wife sitting in a wheelchair because she had a stroke in 2009. And when the stroke happened, I felt completely com prepared because I'd been through this several times before. And I realized as we've been sort of fighting to keep our lives together, that everything that happened in my life up to that point was a preparation for me to be able to help my kids and take care of my kids. And when I was in this situation, I realized that when I watched my kids fight for their lives, when I kind of watched us fight for our lives, I realized that everything, not only that we have done, but everything that the thousands of generations before us have done to survive was a preparation for that very moment when we had to give everything. Everything. And I also realized that the most important job we do, that my mother did with, we, with me, was to turn me into a piece of art. 
Here is her, that, this is my mother, turning herself into a piece of art when she was 27, 28. And reading through her stuff made me realize that she didn't have control, but she had a lot of influence. And it made me realize that when I look at my children, that I had a lot of influence, and that I was able to not control them, but to influence them by seeing them, by asking them for their permissions, asking them for their, what they thought, and then using that. And I found this quote, I'm an improviser, and I found this quote from my mother. She says, Musi musicians improvise on their themes the way I fantasize on mine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.